So, uh, Andrew Perry, thank you so much for joining us today. A real pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. We had some technical issues, and so uh, that's why we see you from from below. Uh, it's a nice, uh, <laughs> it's a nice <laughs> what you're using your phone, and thank you for no matter what staying with us. Uh, Andrew, you're the head of sustainable investing at Hermes uh, Investment Management, and we want to go a bit deeper in the reasons why it's so important. Uh, to really develop sustainable investing, um, generally speaking. But with you, uh, I would like to start by asking you the same question I'm asking everyone. What does public value mean to you personally? For me, it's a recognition that we are all part of an embedded system. We're all in this together, you know, you can't view the capital markets, the investment markets as detached from society or the planet. We form part of that greater ecosystem and the way in which we invest, the way in which we live our lives, the way in which companies manage themselves and governments behave and perform, all have profound impacts that are interconnected and will shape the world to come. So, so for me, it's just a natural part of existing and doing my job. It, we have to see these more holistic outcomes. It's not just about a narrow pers perspective on making money. It's about thinking more broadly and where we all want to go. The, the slogan of Hermes uh, is uh, being good is good business. Yes, or you also say outcomes beyond performance. Uh, that's what is on your website. So we, we get the, the spirit that it's a holistic approach. Indeed, you know, I, we've always taken the view that you, our role is to be responsible investors. Yes, responsible for making good, long-term risk-adjusted returns for our clients so that they can retire in a good financial position, that their savings are looked after in a, in a responsible way that you know, preserves and enhances the real purchasing power, but also a recognition that the way in which we invest and the way in which the companies in which we invest behave themselves have a broader impact on the world around us. They shape those long-term financial returns as well. Systemic issues like climate change, the challenges of demographics, the, the transitions that are being caused by technology. And look at the world of geopolitics at the moment, and trade wars. These are all things that we need to be cognizant of and play our role in helping to shape these better outcomes. So and naturally, all these things are linked. If you think of it in system value, then that's the way of, of, of approaching it, that you know, actions aren't done in isolation. But I mean, among investors, you still remain in a, a, a very, hmm, very noticeable minority. The responsible investors are considered to be, what, 10, 15% of the overall investment world? You know, I, I think the world is changing, and I think that's a far more important is that maybe three years ago, four years ago, talking about environmental, social and governance issues, about stewardship, about sustainability, was often dismissed. Now it's becoming center stage in the debate, not just in Europe, which is led, but in the US, it's increasingly a topic. In Asia, in Japan, even in the, in the uh, emerging markets, people are beginning to be much more aware. Now, this can be a generational issue, you know, we know the rise of the fabled millennials, but even people with grey in their beard like me recognise that this is good business at the end of the day. It's about not just being responsible investors, I've always responsible capitalism. If we want to support the financial returns of the system, we want to support the quality of life of the many, then we need to think about how we tackle these issues. So I think we're all becoming much more aware, different degrees of it. But again, it comes down to system change. And that's the most encouraging thing for me over the last 
few years has been this greater awareness, a greater debate. While not everybody's uh, full believers yet, the, the direction of travel is the most important thing. And what we are discussing actually is the responsibility of each of us as citizens. Uh, whenever we have a bit of money put aside for our own retirement, there are responsibilities to be aware of where this money is invested until we receive it back. Yes, you know, and I think that's been one of the, you know, the, the, the pulls for the industry is that increasingly people are asking more and more questions about where is their money being invested, uh, how is it being uh, looked after, not in terms of just the returns, but also things like voting and engagement, being you know, good stewards of other people's money. So those recognition that those responsibilities go much further. I think it also raises a debate, however, it's not just about financial service products. It's also raising the question about how we all live our own individual lives. You know, one of my colleagues always says, you should always ask anybody with a sustainable investing in their title how it's changed their lives. Uh, they might think differently about food, about mobility, about travel and things like that. So I very much want people to think that it, Yes, the investment industry can support their purpose, but I also want to think people to think about the demand side. How are people actually changing their own lives to change the problem of demand, creating waste, creating CO2 emissions? Because again, we are all in it together. So it's not just about having nice, shiny financial service pro products. We have to go beyond to think about general demand in the, in, in the world. I like very much the way you put a lot. It's about responsible capitalism. It's, re it's responsible society and who we want to become. So if we keep this idea that imagine in few years, considering the growth of uh, this tendency, we will all corporations, regulators, investors be investing into a different uh, capitalism, then impact becomes really key and measurement becomes also key. And I know you've been working a lot on uh, this initiative and trying to uh, really define new indicators for this new uh, system. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, we've, like many people, been thinking about impact investing as a concept. You know, it's not a new concept. It's been, for the last decade or more, probably one of the more innovative areas in finance. You know, the impact investing term was coined by the Rockefeller Foundation, recognizing that financial return is a great way of adding greater scale and, and breadth to, to impact. It gives it duration as well. So... That recognition that uh, financial returns are an important part of the delivery and sustainability of impact has been, I think, very innovative. So, however, it was originally its origins were in, were in philanthropy, uh, in concessionary based returns. So how do you take those notions around additionality, intentionality and measurement and apply it more to the public markets? Now, in public markets, why do you want to do that? Well, remember, public markets, whether it's equity or credit, actually touch virtually every sector and every country in the world. So while the intensity of the impact generated might not be quite the same as in a philanthropic project. If you multiply it out by duration and breadth, the total impact of the, on the system can be incredible. And in fact, if we're not beginning, if we're not thinking in that broader corporate sense about the impacts that we all have and trying to minimize the negatives and reinforce the positives all the philanthropy in the world is not going to move the needle on the dial we are actually talking about mobilizing not billions but trillions to use that phrase with the billions to trillions transition so there the the, the traditional capitalist markets have a, ro a very important role to play now what i like about the concept of impact when i look at it through my lens of public equity and credit in particular, is that it's much more a forward-looking set of opportunities. 
you know, when we think about the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you know, for me, the most important word in, in the goals is goals itself. These are something that we aspire to do in the future, something we are looking to achieve. It's not about remapping of existing activities back to the goals, because that's not going to solve the problem. It's about thinking of innovative solutions. And so for me, especially when we were looking at it through the lens of equities, if you look at it through the lens of products and services that are intentionally designed to un address underserved needs in the global economy, now that's a lot of exciting top line growth for those purposeful companies with the intent of tackling those unmet needs. So for me, that's an exciting growth opportunity as an investor. They're growing these companies because of their desire to tackle under, under met needs. And so it's a rich opportunity set uh, that is, is very exciting. So yeah, so what, what's not to like about thinking of the world in that forward looking, dynamic, innovative way? Look, as a stock picker, that's what my life's always been about. And you know, I, I always like the definition of Mark Campanelli, uh, you know, the founder of Carbon Tracker, who uh, for the definition of the difference between ESG investing and impact. And he always said that ESG is what keeps you up at night. Impact is what gets you up in the morning. Now, I really wish I'd come up with that definition because it's, it's a wonderfully succinct definition, but it really does show you the difference of, uh, between ESG and impact investing. It's that much more forward looking, much more optimistic way of approaching markets. And you are talking about a new impact paradigm. We hear your enthusiasm and, and you're very driven, but speaking of a new impact paradigm is actually a way to speak uh, better to, to the world and to the public as well. Because to be honest, ESG was really uh, a, and is a fascinating um, philosophy, but a lot for experts rather than for the public. Uh, we have lost a, a number of people using these acronyms. Whereas the impact paradigm, uh, I believe, speaks uh, a lot more to each of us. Well, you're very, you're, you're very right in saying it about that. that it, does it speak to people? Does it resonate with people? The problem with things like SRI, uh, ESG is their abstract acronyms. I try right. it out on my mother who's 84 and if I say I'm an ESG investor she wouldn't have a clue what I'm, I'm talking about. As a former nurse she probably thinks it's something to do with my heart and monitoring the, the rhythms. If I say oh I'm a sustainable investor or I'm looking to have a positive impact in the way in which she sort of immediately begins to have an idea of what it's about. So I think there, we should never underplay the power of language. It's a, the power of language to motivate and drive change. It's very important. It's the way that our society is bound together without language, without finding the right words. It's very hard to communicate ideas. Um, but it goes beyond words. It goes beyond, it goes towards actually having a set of aspirations where we can begin to identify the, the, the real and tangible opportunities, where we see the need. You know, needs are somebody's opportunity uh, you know, to supply them. So for me, again, it links to that concept of responsible capitalism, about growing within planetary and society boundaries, recognizing the wider issues, but still looking to develop a financial return to fund people's savings, aspirations, and their retirement. Interesting, really. What I heard, uh, Andrew, since uh, the beginning of this conversation is a people-centered mindset. We used to um, rely to this concept of stakeholders, multi-stakeholders, again, uh, very uh, abstract concepts. And you have been using the word people and each of us, and we are all responsible for this new system. That's really interesting. Uh, how many of you do you feel um, isolated when you speak this way in your, in your sector? Or do you have the feeling that there is a new trend? Oh, I definitely there's a new trend. You know, I, I, I think it's all, it, you're right. It's all about shared value. 
Yes. Uh, that's the most important concept to, to think about, way to think about. It is about systems, it, and we are part of an embedded system. We're all, so I said at the beginning, we're all in it together, whether you like it or not. Uh, in Europe, we, we all talk the same language, in effect. We, all, we sort of have a shared set of values and appreciation that sustainability is not an option, it's an imperative. Mm -hmm. But elsewhere, I go, people are beginning to recognize it. They're, they're beginning to recognize it because many, if you like, old-fashioned business models are becoming challenged. Mm -hmm. They're beginning, by not having the, you know, recognizing that social trends are changing in the way that we eat and the way that we live our lives, you know, the, the difference in generation between um, my generation and uh, my wife's and that of the, my, our children is very different. The patterns of consumption and behavior, you can see that in the rise of vegetarianism, veganism. And so, so I think a lot of businesses are suddenly realizing by not thinking about how society is changing and adapting, that they eas can easily get left behind. Business models have, can die. It's not just about stranded assets, it's about stranded business models. So that's why I, you know, when I talk about it, I do always want people to recognize this should be about good capitalism, deploying capital to where demand is going to be in the future, not where it's necessarily been in the past. And I think that resonates with people, um, irrespective of where you are in the world. Andrew, we're coming uh, close to the end of this conversation. When a corporation comes to you, requests more investment, wants to be sustainable, but feels a bit overwhelmed, what is your advice to them to overcome this uh, overwhelm uh, in sustainability? The, I've always found that companies do an, an awful lot more than they, they ever communicate to shareholders in this area. Um, I think they often have found or have become, led themselves to believe that we're not interested as an investment community in these is issues. They're obviously beginning to see that change with the rise of ESG investing. But if it's just around ESG data alone, then that's not enough because data can actually sometimes create a gulf between the investor and the company if they're not talking about long-term strategy. You know, where we, what we try to do is try to talk to companies about how sustainability is integrated into their business strategy. How does it form part of their capital allocation decisions? How does it shape the long-term value and direction of travel of the business? Because that for me is the really interesting thing. True wealth creation comes not from financial engineering, but cap fixed capital formation for the development of future business prosperity. So I found naturally, and, and our teams here, have found when you, you talk to companies, if you talk more about strategy and how it's linked to sustainability, that gives them a much better platform to talking about the longer term vision. It drags you away from the short term earnings from you know, the noise of the markets. And I, and I think companies sometimes feel liberated by that. It has to, however, go beyond just their carbon and their water reports. It has to be about material issues within the business, the issues of competitive competition and cash flow and challenges and how they're thinking about sustainability within that context. Remember, to be a sustainable business, first you have to survive. So you still have to be a good business. You, you can't just be, say we're green or you know, we're very conscious of social values. If you have a bad business model, you can be as green as you like and you can still fail. So we have to recognize that it has to be part of it. Sustainability has to be part of that conversation on corporate strategy. That's uh, a, a very uh, nice uh, last uh, word. Um, Andrew, I want to thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your thoughts and um, really wishing you the very best uh, over the summer and in your investing uh, research. Thank That's you. That's very kind. It's been a delight talking to you today and thank you for asking me to participate.